and our host for today's talk. At Prescatter, I'm a technical project manager as well as the scholar engagement coordinator. My academic background is in biomedical sciences, and I obtained my PhD in the field of immunology from Northwestern University in 2012. My primary focus was in the differentiation of CD4 positive T cells and how their activity inhibits or promotes the progression of autoimmune disorders. I'd like to kick off our discussion today with a quick poll to get a little bit more information about our audience. So just take a few minutes and uh, select the category that best suits your role at the moment. So I'll give everyone about 10 seconds, so go ahead and put in your information. All right. I see some results coming in. I'll give everyone about five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, so um, based on the poll, we have a pretty diverse crowd today, and I'm really glad to see that as today's talk is about biotechnology concepts that have the potential to affect an enormous range of disciplines. So just to give you an idea, biotechnology can affect a lot of categories, like advanced agriculture, pharmaceuticals, clinical diagnosis, and even personalized medicine and groundbreaking cures for devastating diseases. And with all of this potential, it's no surprise that biotechnology, our topic of discussion today, is a booming industry in the rapid growth phase of its life cycle. It's estimated that the global market for biotechnology will grow at an annual rate of around 11.6% from 2012 to 2017 and reach a value of over $400 billion by the end of 2017. So here at Prescatter, we help companies to better understand and look forward toward that future. In the realm of corporate innovation, companies are constantly faced with new and challenging problems. Prescatter acts at the intersection of academic research and corporate R&D, helping companies to innovate intelligently and confidently by providing analysis and insights, a better understanding of emerging market opportunities, and identifying disruptive technologies like the one in today's presentation. So as our discussion progresses today, keep in mind that all of the biotechnology concepts described are real. They are currently under development, and even though the revival of Jurassic dinosaurs might sound improbable, it certainly wouldn't be the first time that life has surprised us with its resilience. So take, for example, the water bear, which is a microanimal that can survive temperatures around absolute zero and even live in a vacuum of outer space. Uh, the so-called Methuselah plants have been brought back from extinction after 200 million years using their preserved seeds. And scientists at Harvard are even attempting to bring back the woolly mammoth using ancient DNA. So even though you might be thinking that reviving dinosaurs is just Hollywood fiction, keep in mind that Prescouter works with our clients every day in order to uncover solutions to problems that previously seemed unsurmountable. Our goal of open innovation recognizes that there is an enormous expanse of research, knowledge, and natural potential that is unrecognized and underutilized. So how do we work with our clients? Prescouter's core process is as simple as one, two, three. First, a client describes a question, a need, or something they'd like to learn more about. Next, Prescouter assembles a team of scholars recruited globally from tier one research institutions. These scholars use a combination of their own human intelligence networks, as well as proprietary software developed at Prescouter to scan the entire globe for potential solutions to a company's business problem. After several stage-gated meetings with the client team, we deliver a report of curated information addressing the specific business problem. On average, our clients find that the reports contain around 75% new and relevant information which allows for better informed decisions and more importantly, allows them to take action. So how might a typical project with Prescouter work? To give you an idea, let's imagine for today's talk that InGen, a long-standing biotechnology company, has approached Prescouter with their business problem, the need for a reliable, reproducible, and safer method for creating dinosaurs for their new theme park, Jurassic World. So for those of you who are not aware, InGen is actually a fictional biotech company um, that functions the universe of Jurassic Park and is responsible for the creation of genetic engineering and production of those dinosaurs. 
And as many of you know, InGen's original theme park suffered a pretty severe setback in the mid-1980s due to a few missteps in their scientific workflow. So our speakers today will give you a few new and innovative biotechnology solutions that might help, to, that might help a company like InGen to supplement or disrupt their current methods while maintaining ultimate levels of safety. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to our scientist speakers today uh, who will give you a brief introduction about themselves. Hi, my name is Roman. I'm currently a PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And my interests are in optogenetics and synthetic biology. That means I like to rewire existing biological systems and in the past, I've worked on the design of genetic circus bacteria. And um, I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hinati Youssef. I received my PhD at UC Berkeley in molecular and cell biology, where my thesis focused on adult neural and muscle stem cells and their role in aging. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford where I study the neurobiology of aging and neurodegeneration. I'm very interested in the extinction technologies and I'm excited today to discuss the biotechnology behind resurrecting dinosaurs with everyone. Thanks. Hello, I'm Yvonne Ogbowen. I am a graduate of the neuroscience doctoral program at Emory University, where I studied drug addiction in the neurobiology of exercise, uh, where I used preclinical models to understand how exercise could be used as a therapy. And today, I'll be discussing with you the exciting technologies we have on hand that could potentially help us to perform seemingly improbable tasks like resurrect dinosaurs within the Jurassic World universe. Would the techniques from the movies really work? Or are there better methods being developed by real life scientists that could do a better job of creating a dinosaur? Let's begin with the concept that everyone is familiar with from the original movie, the revival of dinosaurs from preserved ancient DNA. One of the most iconic concepts from the movie is of the engine scientists extracting dinosaur DNA from a mosquito that was trapped in ember. I'll be speaking a little bit toward why this might not be the most feasible method and alternative real life techniques that could be more effective in generating dinosaur DNA. Specifically, I would be going over some of the innovative ways that scientists have developed to re-engineer the genetic code of an extent species so that it develops into the morphology more similar of that of one of its ancestors. The potential of this method is that if refined, we could use this approach to edit genetic sequences of a living organism so that it could develop into a dinosaur. As Aki mentioned earlier with the revival of the Methuselah plant, the success of creating previously extinct organisms has reignited the idea of reviving dinosaurs. However, it remains an elusive goal because of the technical challenges that precede it. De-extinction cannot yet be achieved because we can't revive dinosaurs through traditional cloning or splicing practices. All DNA degrades by 6.8 million years, about one-tenth of the time that dinosaurs have been extinct. The lack of a genetic blueprint for dinosaurs or of closely related species into which to place their DNA means that recreating dinosaurs or even dinosaur-like hybrids has long been far out of human reach. One way we could surmount this challenge would be to bring back dinosaurs by modifying bird DNA. But how could this be done? As it turns out, birds are the modern day descendants of dinosaurs. Their morphology and more importantly their DNA share many characteristics with reptiles. A scientific team at Harvard University, led by Bart Anjambola and Arad Abzanov, described a novel approach that bridges paleontology, comparative anatomy, and experimental developmental biology, in which chicken embryos were altered to more closely resemble their ancestors. Here I will describe the process 
in which the proteins in the signaling pathways that promote peak formation in chicken embryos were edited to develop into a snout. The authors did this by first examining the embryonic development of the twin bones, the premaxilla, that forms the beak in birds and snout in other species. They examined the premaxilla across six different species. In figure A, we can see that the reptiles express short paired premaxilla and that birds express one long singular premaxilla which contributes to the dorsal portion of the beak. In figure B, it shows the taxa that contains the avian rostrum clusters away from the other archosaurs. Here we can see that in birds, the twin premaxilla bones fused and grew longer into a singular structure to form the beak. This unique feature distinguishes this clad away from the other species. And finally, in figure C, we Figure C shows how ma major evolutionary transition structures such as wings, feathers, and beaks contributed to the differentiation and evolutionary development of birds. Next, the researchers look at the differential expression of the genes that contribute to the formation of the premaxilla. They examined the candidate gene expression domain in the embryonic phase, analyzed the beak formation in the embryos of chickens, emus, alligators, and turtles. They found that the genes that were critical for the formation of the premaxilla are the genes for fibroblast growth factor 8 and LEF1 in the frontal nasal ectodermal zone. In figure A, the expression pattern of FGF8 and LEF1 and adult skeletal phenotypes in reptiles reveals an ancestral paired gene expression preceding small paired premaxilla in turtles and alligators. In contrast, the gene expression in birds promotes an elongated and fused premaxilla as seen in the chicken and the emu. Here you can see the genes attributed to the fused premaxilla in the chicken and the emu compared to the short and distinct premaxilla pairs in alligators and turtles. Figure B shows the phylogeny of facial patterning gene expression and inferred ancestral states. Note how the genes are polarized in all the other species except in birds where the genes are expressed more continuously. The unique gene expression zone of the two different facial developmental genes early in development was identified solely in the avian species. FGF8 and LEF1 were identified in the frontal nasal prominence in the middle of the face of the embryos, also known as the frontal nasal ectodermal zone. Finally, the authors wanted to test if you could alter beak formation in birds by blocking the signaling for FGF8 and LEF1, part of two pathways important in beak formation. The authors applied small molecule inhibitors for FGF8 and LEF1 early in the development of the chicken embryos. Inhibition of the molecular mechanism for beak formation caused the beak structure to only partially fuse or become fully paired premaxilla. The premaxilla reverted to the palatine bone on the roof of the mouth, resembling the ancestral morphology. In figure A, we can see the skeletal structure of control chicken, experimental chicken, and an alligator, which shows the ancestral paired, abbreviated, and rounded premaxilla in experimental animals, respectively. In figure B, we see the LEF1 expression, as indicated here by the stars, where the expression is more paired-like in the ancestral state, as represented by the alligator. The median zone that pairs the two premaxilla in the controlled chicken is gone in the experimental chicken. Instead, they now have paired ossification. Figure C is another view of this, showing a cross-section of the beak in the controlled chickens and the experimental chickens. And here you can see that the medium fusion zone, as indicated by the upper arrowheads, is absent 
in the experimental uh, chickens, where there it remains separate. The premaxilla in the experimentals were instead paired ossifications. Figure D compares the premaxilla of a controlled chicken without an experimental chicken drawing of the premax early dinosaurs. There we can see that the experimental chicken is more similar to the dinosaur the premaxilla. And finally, figures E and F show how the authors compare the experimental results of the palatine of the chicken with that of an extinct bird known as the Hesperonis regalis. The premaxilla of the experimental chickens is essentially identical to that of Hesperonis regala in its overall configuration. In fact, the authors predict that the beak they engineered predicts the morphology of yet undiscovered early avian fossils that represent a more transitional morphology between birds and dinosaurs. Though the researchers were not aiming to resurrect dinosaurs, their approach provides an insight as to how scientists could potentially resurrect extinct species by altering genetic sequences to revert a developmental process resulting in an organism with a morphology more similar to its ancestors. This technique addresses the main challenges of trying to use dinosaur DNA. DNA has a half-life of 521 million years and is completely degraded by 6.8 million years and in fact becomes unreadable much earlier than that. However, there are still some challenges. We lack the knowledge of post-translational modification and epigenetic change were necessary to create dinosaurs. Knowing how these changes occurred would be necessary for us to succeed in developing a dinosaur from bird DNA. Gene expression is highly adaptable and we don't know enough about all the downstream signaling and epigenetic factors that were necessary to create dinosaurs. But assuming we could work this out, this innovative approach could be one option in resurrecting dinosaurs. And next, my colleague Hanadi will speak about gene editing and reconstructing DNA. Thanks, Yvonne. So as Yvonne described, because DNA has a years, a tenth the time dinosaurs have been extinct, there's no known remaining DNA. However, more realistically, genome editing can be used to de-evolve bird species to dinosaurs. So gene editing technologies can be used to resurrect recently extinct species, to create genomic diversity in endangered species, and in regards to dinosaurs, for de-evolution editing genes in bird species that have evolved from dinosaurs, as Yvonne discussed, and for controlling the levels of gene expression. Uh, gene editing technologies take advantage of endogenous DNA repair machinery. There are two mechanisms by which DNA is repaired following a double strand break, which can be depicted in part A of the image uh, shown. Non-homologous end joining and homology directed repair. For non-homologous end joining, DNA binding proteins recognize the broken DNA and repair it sometimes leading to misalignment, frameship mutations, and even gene knockout. Alternatively, and preferably, homology-directed repair utilizes genomic recombination with homology arms on an exogenous repair template, which recognizes the damaged DNA through complementary base pair binding, resulting in pre precise repair. Biologists and bioengineers have taken advantage of homologous directed recombination to develop methods for precise editing at specific locations in the genome. Homologous recombination mediated targeting has facilitated the generation of transgenic animal models, where certain genes are knocked in or out by manipulation of germline competent stem cells, dramatically advancing many areas of biological research. However, Although hom homologous recombination-mediated gene targeting produces highly precise alterations, the desired recombination events occur extremely infrequently and is very time-consuming, presenting enormous challenges for large-scale applications of gene uh, targeting and editing, such as in the case of dinosaur resurrection. 
Other methods for introducing genetic alterations, such as the use of gene delivery viral vectors, modified viruses, which are modified viruses used to deliver genes into the genome, can result in random insertion, known as integration, of an introduced gene into the gene, possibly resulting in cancer. Alternatively, certain viral delivery tools result in no integration of the gene at all. Therefore, the desired genetic modification or expressed transgene is not permanent or passed on to offspring through the germline. But we're in luck. Uh, recent programmable genome editing technologies that take advantage of homologous recombination-mediated genomic modification have been developed. As shown in B in the diagram, Naturally occurring enzymes which cleave DNA, called endonucleases, have been combined with DNA binding proteins, such as zinc finger domains adopted from eukaryotic species or transcription activator-like effectors, known as tails, adopted from bacteria that can be tailored to recognize specific sequences in our genomes and introduce double-strand breaks to then guide homologous recombination-based gene modifications. However, these proteins can often have nonspecific binding or inefficiencies, in addition to being costly and labor-intensive to generate these DNA binding proteins, with the need to screen many proteins for specific binding to our DNA sequences of interest with minimal unspecific binding. But we're even in better luck, because excitingly, what has really taken the field by surprise and amazement is a new endonuclease-based genome editing technology that has been discovered and developed, as shown in C, which instead of using proteins to recognize and bind DNA, it utilizes a short RNA guide, color-coded red in the picture, uh, rather than proteins to cite uh, specifically recognized DNA sequences we wish to edit making it much easier and efficient to adapt the system to sequences and genes of interest in a very rapid manner. The RNA-guided endonucleases, known as Cas9, have been adopted from the microbial adaptive immune system known as CRISPR. Bacteria use this system to chop DNA uh, sequences of invading viruses. Scientists have adopted the system to instead introduce cuts in specific sequences we would then like modified. So shown on the next slide, I'll describe how the CRISPR-Cas9 system works. Um, as shown on the left, Cas9 enzyme in blue is attached to the RNA through a single guide RNA sequence, shown in green, and is directed to uh, a specific sequence in genomic DNA by another RNA guide shown in orange, which is tailored to each specific desired genome modification and recognizes the genetic sequence through complementary binding. A protospacer adjacent motif, PAM, which is shown here in red, flanks the three prime end of the DNA target site and directs where the Cas9 nucleus cleaves the DNA um, target sequence. For those interested in some more detail, the image on the right describes in stepwise fashion the mechanism of CRISPR-mediated genome modification. So the next slide summarizes the different engineering methods being developed that utilize CRISPR-Cas9. In the interest of time, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip, I'll skip the quick summary of each genome engineering platform method being used to part F, which is relevant for dinosaur resurrection. So in the diagram depicted in F, uh, it describes how functional screens can be performed in order to determine which genome, uh, which genotypes create the desired phenotypes that we wish to be expressed. So this would be particularly applicable to discovering what genes control the desired phenotypes needed for dinosaur resurrection. In part G, also relevant for creating dinosaurs, the CRISPR-Cas9 system has been modified so that instead of just using CRISPR for causing double-strand uh, DNA breaks and editing the genome, it's been changed so that it could also control gene expression. 
the level of expression can be controlled by modifying the Cas9 enzyme into functional effectors such as transcriptional activators or repressors. So the next slide summarizes the different engineering methods being developed that utilize CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, sorry, so um, CRISPR-Cas9 mediated genome modification, as we know, um, has revolutionized the field and is being used for several types of biological applications. So in terms of the real world applications, as shown on this slide, the circular image on the left summarizes um, what these are. So these include for using the system for gene therapy for curing genetic diseases, for cell line modification and development of animal models for basic research, for introducing genetic variation in endangered species to increase health of offspring and chances of survival, as well as for enhancing biofield production pathways in industrially relevant organisms and creating infection resistant crops. In the case of de-extinction, editing the genomes of closely related living species potentially can be done so that the offspring of these closely related species resemble the extinct species, or by editing the preserved genomes of these recently extinct species to be fully intact and fertilizing them in the similar living species. So for example, as shown on the right, the passenger pigeon can be created from a pigeon or the perineum ibex from goats. It's within our reach um, to bring back these animals um, because of uh, strong similarities to existing living species. And so in regards to using CRISPR-Cas9 for InGen in our creation of a Jurassic world, the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technologies will be used by InGen to create a sustainable and safe animal for the theme park. Specifically, we can use the system to reverse the timeline of evolution of dinosaurs to birds back to dinosaurs. We can do this by finding homologous genes that were evolved from dinosaurs and essentially edit them to their older versions. We can determine what genes may have evolved based on a phenotype genotype screening and analysis, so a functional screening as we discussed. For example, as was explained earlier, genes that are responsible for bone and beak formation could be modified to more closely resemble the traits seen in their predecessor dinosaurs, as was recently done. Finally, if dinosaur DNA fragments can hypothetically be found, we can use genome editing to fill in the gaps and create a fully repaired genome. However, as of yet, this has not been possible because of DNA degradation over time, as was discussed. It's important to keep in mind through, um, though, that an interesting finding uh, was recently uh, discovered that dinosaur blood and collagen um, were discovered in fossils. And scientists had no idea how amino acids and cellular membrane components were preserved considering proteins degrade after a few million years. So you never know. Now, Roman will take over in discussing how a dinosaur might grow through gestation. Okay, thank you, Hanadi. So, um, we've heard about different techniques to reproduce ancient DNA or modify it, but there's another important hurdle in the process of resurrecting an extinct animal, and that is the actual growth of a di baby dinosaur or mammoth from a cell with that DNA. So, the first step would be to get the dino DNA into a cell. More precisely, the DNA needs to be inserted into a donor egg cell, which was first denucleated. This is, in principle, um, not a big deal, since this is already a standard process in the cloning of animals nowadays. However, if there is no living mammoth or even dinosaur, which animal could have that fertilized egg cell implanted and carry a pregnancy to term? So ultimately, the embryo would need to grow inside another species, which is called interspecific pregnancy. One obvious choice as a surrogate mother for, for example, the mammoth, would be the Asian elephant. You can see here, its closest relative. But actually, it's not that easy. There are many different factors that prohibit um, interspecies pregnancies, such as rejection by the mother's immune system, 
or nutritional incompatibility between the mother's metabolism and the embryos. But it is possible in some cases. For example, a horse embryo survives in a donkey uterus, although not vice versa. However, in Asian and African elephants, this has not been possible yet. But as odd as it may sound, the Asian elephant is actually more closely related to the mammoth than it is to the African elephant, so the chances might be a bit, little better in that case. Once there was instance of an Asian-African elephant hybrid, the little one that you see here in the left image. And uh, this one could be delivered by an Asian elephant, probably because the biology of the hybrid closely resembled the one of its mother. Unfortunately, it died after 12 days, but this still illustrates that if we were able to create at least a hybrid of a mammoth and an Asian elephant, the chances of a successful pregnancy could be improved. This also relates to what um, Hanadi and Yvonne spoke about before, about devolving birds into dinosaurs, because on the way we would um, have to work with some kind of hybrid animals. Now, the closest science ever got to resurrecting extinct animals using the surrogate method was the one time when a baby Bocardo, also known as Pyrenean Ibex, was reborn. The Bocardo went extinct in the year 2000 in the Spanish Pyrenees, but researchers managed to preserve some tissue of it at that time. They cloned those preserved cells, inserted embryos derived from them, into the wombs of females of a related species, and from 74 implanted embryos, one was actually born. This one resurrected baby Bocardo, however, suffocated at 11 minutes after birth due to lung defects. Now, considering that the Bucardo DNA was only some years old and the mother belonged to a closely related species, Resurrecting dinosaurs in, say, bird eggs does seem like an overly ambitious idea. After all, the dinosaurs and birds diverged in evolution about 150 million years ago, so they are not quite relatives from today's point of view. Now, there is another alternative. A new technology that comes from an in vitro fertilization clinic at Cornell University. The researchers Lou, Spandorfer and others have developed a so-called endometrial co-culture method. They isolate cells from the uterus of the potential mother, seed these cells on a biodegradable scaffold and make these cells grow into womb-like tissue. Then the fertilized egg cell is planted on the artificial womb and allowed to develop, to develop into an embryo outside of the mother's uh, womb. Until now, the embryos cannot develop outside until the very end, but the research groups at Cornell are actually working on this in mice. So if we could create an artificial uterus with this technology from dinosaurs' DNA, it could sort of grow in its own womb. And this technology would not only allow us to circumvent the rejection by the mother's immune system, we could also very precisely control the chemical composition of the embryo's environment because we have direct access to it and thereby fine-tune it to the dinosaur's needs. Okay, so now what happens if we actually manage to grow a fully-sized dinosaur? Those of you who have seen Jurassic Park are probably wondering about how to control um, these creatures when they are roaming a reserve. In a scenario where we only have a very few valuable creatures, one approach could be optogenetics. So, this very popular method requires making some genetic changes to your organism of interest but that would be a minor effort compared to reconstructing an entire dinosaur genome and could sort of be done in the process. The principle is to take a gene that originally makes microscopic algae light sensitive. This gene leads to the production of a light sensitive channel that 
creates a small electrical signal if it absorbs light. Researchers have managed to transfer that gene into neurons or nerve cells in all kinds of animals and make their neurons respond to light. As a result, we can now control the neuronal activity of animals with lasers in a very precise and harmless manner. In other words, we can control the brain activity. So, to get the light into the animals, or in our case, dinosaurs, um, skulls, a small opening has to be made in the skull. And either a fiber optics cable is connected to the skull, or a tiny implant is used, which can actually be remote controlled. You can see it here on the right. This method has already been used to control the behavior of many different animals, such as mice, insects, worms, monkeys, and others. So there are theoretically no reasons why it could not be used in dinosaurs. With this method, it was possible to make the animals walk in circles, make them freeze in motion, or even change their memory. So this way, you could basically remote control your T-Rex from your laptop. A very different kind of problem arises from large populations of animals, such as, say, a mammoth herd. You cannot perform surgery on hundreds of animals in a feasible manner. And to be honest, there is no existing bioengineering technology that can give humans 100% control over large populations. This is actually a real concern nowadays, if you think about controlling, for example, the spread of genetically modified plants. So, there are ways to genetically modify organisms that we have some control over them. And one of those methods is the so-called toxin-antitoxin switch. In this case, the organisms are genetically modified so that they continuously produce a toxin and an antitoxin at the same time, which both neutralize each other. But if the organism comes into contact with a certain predefined substance, that means by us predefined, it stops to produce antitoxin and effectively poisons itself and dies. However, there is a big problem with this approach because it can always happen that an individual mutates and evolves, which means it loses the toxin gene and becomes immune. That would be the natural course of evolution, and it's very difficult to avoid that. Now, a different approach relies on making the animal dependent on a supplement. In the first Jurassic Park movie, the dinosaurs were genetically modified to be dependent on lysine, an amino acid that is usually non-essential. Actually, that was not the best idea, as you know from the movie, because lysine can be found in about every organism on Earth. It's abundant and it's not difficult to just find and eat it in the wild. And again, there is the risk of mutation. But the research group of George Church at Harvard has taken this approach a little further and they have vastly re-engineered bacteria to be dependent on the amino acid biphenylaniline depicted here on the right. This substance is absolutely absent in the wild and the genetic changes introduced to make the bacteria dependent on it are so tremendous that it is extremely unlikely that any organism would lose all of those changes simultaneously. So on the graph, you see the um, so-called evolutionary escape and the different changes that were introduced in the bacteria. And what you can see is that if only three genes were changed to be dependent on the synthetic substance, the escape frequency, and that is the, um, the ability of the bacteria to escape that genetic restriction, this escape frequency became absolutely undetectable. So that is a huge uh, leap in restricting the spread of GMOs. Admittedly, it would be a huge effort to re-engineer any organism in this way that's a little more complex than bacteria, but it is the best we can do at the moment. Okay, so we've been talking about genetically modified organisms, remote controlled dinosaurs and the like, and obviously there are some ethical questions that need to be considered and um, for this, I'd like to hand over to Hanadi now. Thank you. Thanks, Roman. So while there is much excitement over the idea of the extinction and bringing back extinct species from the dead, there are also many critics of this. 
The biggest worry and criticism is the fact that there are already many thousands of species alive that are injured, and so many critics believe, uh, and so many critics believe that resurrecting dinosaurs would be a waste of our resources. Rather than spend so much on bringing back animals from the dead, where we don't have places for them to live and ecosystems to support them, we should instead focus our resources on maintaining the endangered species we do have. Uh, in that regard, it's interesting to note that a lot of the same technologies used to bring back animals from the dead, especially in regards to genome editing, could actually be used um, to preserve endangered species. For example, when a population gets too small, there's less genetic variability, and so due to things like inbreeding that could cause sickness and disease and accelerate the extinction of a species. However, with genome editing, we could reintroduce genetic variability into surviving animals and enhance their ability to propagate and live well in an ever-changing ecosystem. Why not focus technologies on preservation rather than de-extinction? So overall, a major issue brought up by critics of creating a Jurassic world is our limited natural resources in space. We already have so many endangered species as a result of this. Um, do we really have space to accommodate dinosaurs? Finally, another issue is the fact that there are major, that dinosaurs are major predators. So the question that we all fear, and as we saw in Jurassic Park, is if dinosaurs come into be being, even if we try our best to control them through certain switches, such as Roman described, at the end of the day, who will be at the top of the food chain? Will we remain the apex predator? Or will dinosaurs once again roam the earth and lead potentially to the endangerment of the human species? Today, we've discussed some hard science related to the resurrection of extinct species. But as the movies have taught us, it's also crucial to keep the ethical consideration in mind. Thank you so much, Yvonne, Roman, and Hanadi. So I'm sure that many of you came into this talk thinking that biotechnology associated with reviving dinosaurs would only exist in Hollywood movies. But our speakers have presented today some real life science that is poised to disrupt and change the future of a variety of markets, including biopharma and medicine. And I hope that you've also gotten an idea of how Prescouter can work with not only fictional clients like InGen, but also real life companies by identifying disruptive technologies capable of addressing business problems that might at first seem unsurmountable. So if you have any questions about Prescouter or the Prescouter process, please send an email to me at auedda at prescouter.com and visit us on the web at www.prescouter.com. Uh, and with that, I'd like to open the floor up to questions. Um, so uh, Roman, uh, we did have a question come in uh, during your talk about gestation. So uh, the question was, uh, the gestation examples were all for placental mammals. Uh, how would this compare for oviparous reptiles? Yeah, that's a good question. And uh, I'm aware that I spoke very little about reptiles or oviparous uh, animals. Because, unfortunately, the main research that has been done in that area until today has only been for placental animals, or more generally speaking, mammals. And um, that is uh, basically the point why there was very little hard data available to talk about these things. So if you think about the interspecific pregnancy part, I guess that could be easily translated to um, to reptiles, because the, the process would be more or less the same. It would just be uh, more laborious um, uh, research necessary. Uh, talking about the artificial womb, now that is very specific for uh, mammals, that is true. However, the idea of recreating the um, embryo's environment outside of the mother's body is more or less the same. And I imagine that it might actually be easier to do this for oviparous reptiles because they already um, grow in eggs and are a bit more, well, it would be a little less in vivo technique. So it might be easier to recreate this environment in the laboratory because it's more isolated from the mother's body. Uh, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Roman. Um, we had another question come in. Um, so Yvonne, um, there was a question come in about your um, gene suppression technique. So um, other than birds, um, for example, what other animals could be brought back using those gene suppression techniques? Um, for example, could we bring back saber-toothed tigers uh, by editing the genome of tigers? Yvonne, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I, yeah, those, those are actually very good questions. Uh, uh, people have asked this question already, and most likely it would be uh, a species that's not hasn't been as extinct for quite as long as dinosaurs. Uh, more realistically, probably the passenger pigeons, since there are still some closely related uh, relatives of it that are alive. And another likely candidate might be the auroch, which is a pre story cattle uh, that settlers from India and Eurasia domesticated and some of the modern day cattle the DNA from the modern day kind of similar enough to that one that it's possible these technologies could at least be used to attempt to bring those two back and another one that was brought up also was the gastric breeding frog there's the other bright action great thank you so much Yvonne um, Hanadi, uh, there was a question that came in um, regarding your genome editing techniques, the CRISPR and Cas9. Uh, can you describe how the CRISPR Cas9 can be used to uh, confer those genotypes that allow for the desired dinosaur phenotype? Sure. If we could uh, go back to page uh, slide 19 in um, figure F. So on the, this image depicted, uh, part F demonstrates how the CRISPR-Cas9 library could, de could be developed with numerous different RNA guides um, binding to different parts of the genome, which could be synthesized through cloning of a guide RNA library in bacterial plasmids, as shown in the image, and inserting them into viruses to use as delivery agents. So this library could then be introduced into cells of interest, um, resulting in multiple genotypes and phenotypes being expressed. Um, the desired phenotypes could be enriched for, and then through sequencing, we could determine which RNA guide targets a specific gene and is responsible for the desired phenotype. Hope that uh, explains a little bit better. Great. Thanks, Anadi. Actually, there was another question that came in um, about the Cas9 CRISPR system. Um, can you describe how the system can be modified to control gene expression rather than just um, introducing those genetic modifications? Um, yeah, sure. So also on uh, the slide in G, G demonstrates how the Cas9 nuclease, which is the enzyme responsible for actually cutting the DNA, can be modified to introduce different functional effectors in the enzyme. So that it binds the DNA still through the RNA guide, but instead of cleaving the bound DNA, its expression is instead controlled through changing the enzyme and introducing enhances or silencers, um, similar to how gene expression is naturally controlled. So basically just changing the enzyme from a cutter to a gene expression controller. Awesome. Thanks so much, Nadi. Um, so Yvonne, there was a question that came in regarding your um, manipulation or your talk on the manipulation of the birds to uh, de-extinct them toward dinosaurs. The question was, um, was the chicken whose beak structure was changed allowed to be born or was it done inside the egg? Um, if it was allowed to be born, did the change in the beak structure change the ability to breathe? So all of this was done inside the egg. They opened up the egg in order to do the manipulation, but the chicken was not allowed to be born. It was a terminal procedure. So this was just looking at morphology, not function. Awesome. Thank you so much, Yvonne. Um, we had one more question come in. Um, for you, Yvonne. Um, so the question was, um, what might be the benefit um, of bringing back extinct animals? Such as the immediate benefits of bringing back extinct animals would be it gives us a better insight on 
the evolutionary processes that are involved in developing uh, in, in speciation, developing particular species, specific forms uh, that are specific in spe specific species. Another benefit would be that it would probably leap forward our technological advancement of some of these techniques that we discussed today. And, uh, would be able to develop more sophisticated biotechnological tools that could have applications beyond bringing back extinct species. Thanks so much, Yvonne. Um, Hanadi, there was one question about the time that it would take in order to actually um, bring back dinosaurs using the methods that were described today. So the question was, uh, how long would it take to resurrect dinosaurs if the evolution uh, were being used today? Okay, I can uh, answer to the best of my knowledge. Um, I believe it would take many generations um, of deal evolution, um, potentially hundreds of years, though it's it. Um, will be much quicker than the natural evolution process because we're guiding it and doing directed rounds of de-evolution and selection. But it's definitely, it definitely won't happen overnight, for sure. Thank you. 